From the Beginning to the End, Part 1, Atlantis, Home of the Greatest Friendship, by Greg L. Sticker. In the beginning, it was very dark and void. There were no galaxies, constellations, and no moons, planets, or any other celestial bodies. There was only time itself. Time was alone and motionless. God then formed out of the deep a light and broke it up into many components. He then formed galaxies and constellations with stars and suns and moons and planets. And then God looked at one planet among millions and said, This one planet, three spaces from its sun, is special looking to me. In time, God made rocks and then stones, then created he boulders. And then came hills and then mountains. Finally, he deemed it necessary to make an ocean God then conceived life. He first made molecules, and then he made proteins, then he made plants, then he made animals, and then he made people, the human race. The human race divided into families, then tribes, villages, nations, kingdoms, and empires. One such empire we will take into account. It is the empire of Atlantis. The Empire of Atlantis was a land ruled by the just Emperor Leophus. Leophus ruled with a fair and mighty arm. He was a close friend and associate of Pontius the Wise. Pontius was a priest of Neptune. Leophus used Pontus' advice carefully, for Leophus knew every prophecy came straight from the god Neptune. The island continent was divided by Atlantis to the north, in Atlantica to the south. The kingdom of Atlantica was ruled by the nefarious ruler Ignatius, who hated Leophus. Even when the two rulers were children, when Atlantis was under the single rule of Leodemus the Great, Leophus' father, Ignatius, was jealous of Leophus. When Ignatius was 23 years old, he was a centurion. He led his soldiers, who, like himself, were from the less wealthy southern sector into revolt. Ignatius stirred up the old hatred of the southern peasants toward the northern intellectual aristocrats. Mm -hmm. 
After a two-year bloody civil war, Laodamus' government was overthrown. It was then that a young priest was summoned to the royal court. While Laodamus was preparing for battle, Laophus, who was only 18 at the time, approached the priest who had just consulted with the boy's father. Laophus earnestly asked if his father was going to survive the battle. Pontius put a firm right hand over Leotha's shoulders and said that sorrowfully it was over for Leotimus' rule. Leophus then vowed to take power and destroy Ignatius. Then Pontius promised to be at Leophus' aid any time he needed him. Two months after the overthrow of Laodamus, as well as his death in battle, Ignatius realized that the united Atlantean Empire, as he called the nation, was still festering from the wounds that the Civil War brought upon it. Furthermore, there was really nothing that the soldiers could have done to appease the northern citizens, and the threat of a revolt and another war was frightening to Ignatius. Reluctantly, Ignatius sent an emissary to write a treaty dividing Atlantis, the empire to the north, that Leophus became emperor of, and the kingdom of Atlantica to the south, ruled by Ignatius. In ten years, Leophus and Pontus grew from mere acquaintances to best friends. The brief ten-year period saw the northern empire living in peace and prosperity. In the tenth year of Ignatius' rule, he declared that Leophus was presiding over an illegal empire. A six-month war ensued, in which the mighty arm that Ignatius built up for the decade proceeded in a bloody trail towards Leophus' palace. The kingdom's army troops were burning villages, murdering whoever stood in their path. The imperial army of the north fought bravely, yet was not prepared for the brutal tactics of their opponents who were trained to be precision killers, whereas the soldiers of the empire were trained in basic self-defense tactics and not in any method of brutality or how to destroy civilians as well as military targets. Laophus was in the mountains consulting with his generals when his daughter was seen running below with a chariot belonging to Pontus. Laophus sensed trouble and immediately assigned a courier below. In an hour, the courier returned with the sad news that Leophus' entire family, except for Candace, his youngest daughter of 14 years, was slain. With that, Leophus walked to the edge of a cliff and knelt weeping and praying for the wrath of Neptune to fall upon Ignatius. When Leophus returned to his generals, he could not barely contain himself. He was speaking as a madman. He then ordered a duel between himself and Ignatius, a duel to the death. That evening in the temple, Leophus with his daughter placed the traditional lotus wreath over his wife and son's corpse. This was a time-honored funeral ritual where honor and safe passage was guaranteed. Then, as a custom, at military or royal funerals, 
a sword was drawn crosswise over the bodies. Thus the soul of Leopha's son and wife was met with honor, befitting a royal family at Neptune's court. After the funeral and the bodies were taken to be buried, Laophus informed Pontus of his intention to fight Ignatius. Pontus refused to give his blessing. Laophus was taken aback by his best friend's refusal, let alone a priest's refusal to any man, emperor or otherwise, to give his blessing. Pontus said that he only blesses sensible and worthwhile ventures. Besides, Pontus warned Laophus that if he fought Ignatius and was killed, then Ignatius would trample his body and hang it in some public place and make fun of him and then reassume power over Atlantis. Laophus turned white as ass and said that as scary as it sounds, he must go about that risk and defeat Ignatius. Then Laophus said that if he defeats Ignatius, he would feed his corpse to wild beasts. In an arena full of spectators, Laophus then turned and left. At noon the next day, Laophus had a courier deliver the grave message. A day and a half later, Ignatius received the message and bid the courier farewell and declared a feast and party. At nightfall, Ignatius was intoxicated and babbling as a lunatic. He told his chief generals, that he would slaughter that pathetic weakling and display his body in an arena for beasts to devour. Laughter ensued, and Ignatius staggered out with his generals into the royal chariot, and they rode off into the night, drunk as fools. By two mornings, they were at the gates of Laophus' palace. Pontus summoned Laophus. Pontus begged and pleaded with Laophus not to fight, but instead to let him fight on his behalf. Laophus would not relent, however. Laophus was now face to face with Ignatius. Ignatius was intoxicated again, for he brought two cases of wine along on the trip. Laophus could hardly stand the smell of his breath. Laophus then stepped outside his gate and said, The battle will commence. May the rightful ruler of Electus prevail. Pontus ran outside the gate and stole Ignatius' sword and said as drunk as he was, it would not be fail, fair to him and Leophus to fight. He suggested that Ignatius sober up. Ignatius obliged and left for three hours. When he returned, he was prepared to fight. Leophus came out and warily Pontus blessed him. Ignatius mockingly asked for a blessing of his own. Pontus said, your blessing awaits you at your arrival in Hades. Pontus then departed to the palace courtyard in whites as the battle got underway. Ignatius fought surprisingly fair. Laophus put up a good fight. Then suddenly the street turned dark and a thundercloud rolled by and stopped, leaving darkness everywhere. Frightened, Ignatius accused Laophus of using sorcery to win. Pontus heard the accusation and swung his wand at the thundercloud and caused lightning to strike and connect with the wand. Pontus commanded, in the name of Neptune, that the cloud would disperse. The cloud showered sparks everywhere, scaring Ignatius, giving him a fatal heart attack. His generals then snatched Ignatius' body and they journeyed back to the southern kingdom. Laophus then called a halt to the war and assumed power over a united Atlantis. Thus the dynasty of his father Laodamus continued for 30 more years until his death of natural causes at the age of 58 and a quarter years.
Pontius remained the priest of the royal court, first under Candace, then under Leophus II, the son of Candace. In the first month of Leophus II's rule, Pontius died at the age of 97. At the request of Leophus II, Pontius remains replaced in the temple of Neptune in a crypt. Before the cataclysm that destroyed Atlantis, both Pontus and Leophus crypts were taken for reburial in what is now Portugal. The crypts were discovered by archaeologists in 1973 along with several artifacts, artifacts such as Pontus Juan, which occultists say still has power in it, the office ceremonial sword, and an inscription on stone that says, The only thing worth saving is not gold, nor is it silver, for they do not gain anything but wealth, which can be stolen. A friend cannot be stolen. A friend lasts forever, if not in life, in memory.